Today's video is brought to you by Fabulous. Start building better habits with Fabulous and its science-backed data routines. More in them in a bit. The mid-1980s were a pretty good time for Los Angeles. The city was coming off hosting the 1984 Summer Olympic Games, still considered the most profitable Olympics in modern times. It had also just overtaken the city of Chicago as the second most popular city in the country. It was also gearing up for a visit from the Pope, and the LA Lakers were the most popular thing in sports. But not always well, because Los Angeles had a bogeyman, one who was very real and much scarier than all of his fictional counterparts. Like Freddy Krueger, he attacked when people were at their most vulnerable, at night, when they were in bed. Young, old, middle-aged, men, women, nobody was safe from Richard Ramirez, the sick, depraved, devil-worshipping killer who became known as the Night Stalker. For years, the violent fantasies of our killer remained just that fantasies. However, it was inevitable that one day he would try to live out his depraved dreams, and he finally did it on June the 28th, 1984. His target was a 79-year-old woman named Jenny Vinkow, who lived in a Los Angeles neighborhood called Glassell Park. It is unclear what made Ramirez choose her, but it is likely that she was a victim of opportunity. She had left a window open during the night because it was hot, and the killer probably saw a home that was easy to break into. He simply removed a screen and climbed inside. Once he was in, Ramirez unleashed a furious and merciless attack on this helpless victim. Jenny Vinkow was beaten, raped, stabbed, and had her throat slashed so violently that she had been nearly decapitated. Afterwards, the killer took his time and ransacked the place looking for valuables to sustain his drug addiction. This pattern would become the modus operandi for the man who would go on to drive the city of Los Angeles into a state of abject terror. But that was still about a year away at this point. For whatever reason, Ramirez cooled off after the Vinkow murder, waiting almost nine months before striking again. But when he did, his killing spree began in earnest, and Los Angeles was now facing the wrath of the Night Stalker. On March the 17th, 1985, 22-year-old Maria Hernandez pulled into the garage of her home in Rosemead, California. She got out of her car when she was approached by a strange man dressed in all black and wearing a baseball cap pulled down low over his head, who then pointed a gun at her face. Maria begged for mercy, but her pleas fell on deaf ears as man pulled the trigger. A loud bang shook the garage, and Maria fell to the floor as the shooter kicked her body out of the way to enter the house. His complete disregard for her ended up being her salvation, because if he would have looked closer, he would have seen that Maria Hernandez was still alive. Instinctually, she raised her hands when Ramirez pointed his gun at her head, and in a one-in-a-million shot, the bullet ricocheted off the car keys that Maria was holding in her hand and simply grazed her. Her 34-year-old roommate, Dale Okazaki, did not share her fortune. Dale had heard the gunshot and was hiding behind the kitchen counter when Ramirez walked up to her and shot her, killing her instantly. Afterwards, Ramirez walked out of the house and ran into Maria Hernandez, trying to stumble away. He could have easily gunned her down if he wanted, but instead he decided to put his weapon back in his belt and simply walk away. We don't know what prompted this action, but it's certainly not because his bloodlust had been satiated. Just an hour later, the criminal struck again when he pulled 30-year-old Sai Lian Yu out of her car, shot her twice, and then ran away. Yu was still alive when the police found her, but she died before reaching the hospital. It did not take long for the police to link these crimes together, mainly because all the shootings were done with a 22 caliber handgun, and witnesses at both scenes provided descriptions of the same man. He was tall, thin, either white or a light-skinned Latino, with dark curly hair and rotting teeth. The violent and seemingly random nature of the attacks alerted the public and the police as the media referred to the criminal as the Valley Intruder. It only took 10 days before the Night Stalker struck again. On March the 27th, the killer broke into the home of Vincent and Maxine Zazara, located in Whittier, Los Angeles County. He shot both husband and wife in the head, killing them instantly, but he then proceeded to indulge his sadistic side on Mrs. Zazara. She was found naked and mutilated, with numerous stab wounds all over her body, and her eyes had been gouged out. This would become a recurring theme with the Night Stalker, as the criminal refined his killing method to line up with his twisted fantasies. The men were 
dispatched quickly, as they were mere obstacles so that he could focus his attention on the women. After the death of the Zazaruses, the Night Stalker put on the brakes for a bit, waiting almost two months before another deadly attack. But just because the Night Stalker was not active did not mean that neither was Richard Ramirez. Unlike many other serial killers, Ramirez preoccupied his time with a lot of other crimes, including burglary, theft, kidnapping, rape, and assault. Most disturbing were a series of child abductions that started in February 1985 around the San Gabriel Valley. All the children had been taken to abandoned buildings or construction sites where they were sexually assaulted and then abandoned, but several of them were able to provide descriptions of their attacker that would later prove instrumental in convicting him. It was these descriptions that first caused one of the lead investigators in the case, Detective Gil Carrillo, to suspect that the same man might be responsible for all of these crimes. The one detail that stood out to him was the criminal's bad teeth and foul breath, one characteristic that all of his victims noticed. Not many other investigators bought the idea at first. The same guy kidnapping children while also breaking into people's homes and killing them while they slept, sometimes using a gun and sometimes using a knife, sometimes just shooting them once while other times mutilating the bodies, not to mention that these crimes targeted children, young women, middle-aged couples and the elderly. Well, anything was possible, of course, but this was considered simply too unlikely. If Carrillo wanted anyone to believe his hypothesis, he would need a bit more evidence than bad breath. Fortunately for him, he soon got it in the form of a shoe print. The Night Stalker had left a very distinct shoe print at the Zazara crime scene. It came from a Avia sneaker, size 11 and a half, most likely black, based on witness descriptions. Police checked with the manufacturer and discovered that just six pairs of sneakers matching that criteria had been shipped in the entire United States, with a single pair being sold in Los Angeles because the model had just come out earlier that year. As one of the detectives put it, it was almost like a signed signature. Then, during one of the child abductions, the kidnapper took his victim to a construction site where he stepped in wet cement, leaving behind an identical shoe print. A short while later, a teenage girl named Whitney Bennett was attacked with a tire iron during a break-in, and her assailant left behind the same print. At that point, it became obvious that all of these crimes, as varied as they were, were all being committed by the same man. In May, the Night Stalker resumed his killing spree. On the night of May the 14th, 1985, he attacked Bill and Lillian Doy in their home in Monterey Park. First, he shot Bill Doy in the face before restraining his wife with thumb cuffs and raping her. Afterwards, he once again proceeded to ransack the house looking for valuables to steal. Lillian Doy recovered from her injuries. Her husband was still clinging to life when the Night Stalker left their house, but he died in the hospital. Once more, detectives discovered the same unique footprints at the crime scene, this time in the flower bed. The shoe prints would be found at a few more crime scenes, but eventually it would turn out to be a dead end. Of course, we now know that ultimately it didn't matter because the Night Stalker was caught without it. But at the time, it was considered a major step back when the police lost one of their biggest leads. This happened when the mayor of San Francisco, Diane Feinstein, accidentally revealed the clue in a press conference, unaware that it was privileged information. After that, the killer got rid of the sneakers, and they've never been recovered. Now, okay, we'll get back to our story in just a minute, but first, here's a word from today's fantastic video sponsor, Fabulous. Fabulous is the number one self-care app that helps you build better habits and achieve your goals. Fabulous uses the proven tenets of behavioral science to help you build healthy habits one task at a time. So, how does it work? Well, let's say you're working from home, but you're struggling to fit exercise and healthy eating into your new routine. Or maybe you're a writer who's having trouble finding time throughout the day to put pen to paper. You see, everybody's got something they're trying to work on, right? Fabulous is going to help you create new habits that really last by giving you a friendly, intuitive day planner that'll help you create a long-lasting routine. Its self-guided mode helps you keep on track by breaking down larger tasks into smaller bite-sized goals. Or if you're looking for something a little more active, Fabulous can offer advice and guidance on everything from professional development to mental wellness. Pretty soon, you're checking things off your calendar like an absolute CEO boss man. It's like having both a task manager and a coach right in the palm of your hand. So create yourself a little schedule with a task list and let Fabulous keep you honest. Before you know it, Fabulous has gotten you into a good routine and you're well on your way to achieving your personal goals. So it's time to start building your ideal daily routine. Right now is a special deal for you guys. The first 100 people to click in the link in the description below will get a week for free, plus 25% off a Fabulous premium membership. So get over there, try it out, and let's get back to today's video. The next attack occurred a couple of weeks after the Doy family. On May the 29th, 1985, the Night Stalker drove to Monrovia, where he broke into the house of two elderly sisters named Mabel Bell and Florence Lang, both in their 80s. This time, he used a hammer and an electrical cord to assault the two women, afterwards looting their home and leaving them to their fate. 
They were discovered a couple of days later, by which point both sisters were still alive, although in critical condition. Florence Lang recovered, but Mabel Well died in the hospital. What made this crime scene immediately stand out from the others was that the night stalker used lipstick to draw pentagrams on the walls of the house and on Mabel Bell's thigh. This was the first time that he indicated a connection to Satanism, which would become much more prevalent in the crimes that followed and during his trial. His appetite for violence had not been sated yet, and so the Night Stalker struck again the very next day. This time, he picked the house of a 42-year-old, Carol Kyle, who lived in Burbank with her 11-year-old son. He handcuffed the boy and locked him in the closet, and then sexually assaulted Carol Kyle, repeatedly warning her not to look at him and that he would shoot her if she did. Afterwards, he locked her in the closet as well and looted the place before leaving without killing anyone. The Night Stalker likely claimed one victim in the month of June, 32-year-old Patty Elaine Higgins, who was found in her home with numerous stab wounds and her throat slashed. Although a neighbor said she saw Ramirez on the night of Higgins' death, ultimately he was never tried for a murder, so she is not part of his convicted kill count, which stands at 13, even though Ramirez himself bragged in prison that he killed a lot more than that. We know for a fact of one murder that had not been linked to him until 2009, 25 years after it actually happened. It occurred on April 10, 1984, placing it before the Night Stalker killing spree and even before the death of Ginny Vinkow, making it Ramirez's first known murder. On that day, Ramirez lured a nine-year-old girl named Mei Lung into an apartment building. Her body was later found hanging from a pipe, and DNA evidence left at the crime scene connected the crime to the Night Stalker decades later. As for Patty Higgins, the reason why the prosecution never went after Ramirez for her murder was because his defense attorney successfully argued that it was a weak case against their client that would be unfairly tainted by lumping it together with other cases with much stronger evidence. Ultimately, the judge dismissed the charge entirely in order to avoid having a separate trial for it, but there remains very little doubt in anyone's mind that Patty Higgins Higgins was a victim of the Night Stalker. July 1985 proved to be the busiest month of the Night Stalker's criminal career, committing no less than six separate attacks targeting nine people. First came the murder of 75-year-old Mary Louise Cannon, who was found dead in her home in Arcadia on July the 2nd. Her killer attacked her while she slept, first bludgeoning her with a lamp and then stabbing her with a kitchen knife. As always, the Night Stalker rummaged through her home afterwards to steal anything of value. Just three days later, Ramirez attacked teenager Whitney Bennett with a tire iron, but she survived the encounter, even though she needed hundreds of stitches. On July the 7th, the Night Stalker committed two attacks, both in Monterey Park. Sophia Dickman was restrained and sexually assaulted, but Ramirez did not try to kill her. Joyce Nelson, however, felt the full brunt of his murderous wrath as the Night Stalker bludgeoned and stomped her to death, leaving the familiar Avia sneaker shoe prints on the side of her head. July the 20th was another double event for Ramirez as he targeted two households in different parts of Los Angeles County, one in Glendale and the other in Sun Valley. First were Maxon and Leela Needing, an elderly couple in their late 60s. The Night Stalker broke into the home with a gun and a machete. After striking at both victims with the machete, he killed them both with shots to the head, then continued to mutilate their bodies with the blade. Afterwards, he robbed their home and left, leaving behind his 22 caliber gun for some unknown reason. He already had another firearm by this point, but this move allowed the police to positively connect the murders with some of the previous shootings. After he killed the Needings, that Night Stalker drove to Sun Valley in a stolen car and broke into the home of the Kavanath family. The patriarch of the family, 32-year-old Chaineron Kavanath, was targeted first. He was killed instantly with a shot to the head while he slept. His wife, Somkid, was beaten and raped, and their eight-year-old son was restrained while Ramirez plundered the home for valuables. August was almost as busy for Ramirez. He started on the night of the 6th, breaking into the Northridge home of Chris and Virginia Peterson. He walked into their master bedroom as they slept and shot them both point-blank with a 25 caliber pistol. Virginia was hit in the head and her husband in the neck, but miraculously, they both survived their injuries. Feeding off pure adrenaline, Chris Peterson even managed to get up and charge the intruder, who fired two more shots and missed before fleeing the crime scene. Obviously, this attack did not go as Ramirez intended, so he only waited two days before striking again, this time in Diamond Bar, California. The Night Stalker broke into the home of Elias and Sakina Aberwath, killing the husband right away before attacking the wife. Ramirez threatened the lives of Sakina's two young sons in order to get her to cooperate, and afterwards came his usual MO of sexual assault and robbery. His next attack occurred on August the 18th, but it was unique because it took place in San Francisco. As far as we know, this was the first time that the Night Stalker left Los Angeles County for one of his break-ins. He targeted the home 
of Peter and Barbara Pan. Both were shot in the head, but Barbara survived her injuries. Even though he traveled to a different county, there was little doubt in the investigators' minds that they were dealing with the same killer. He had drawn pentagrams on the walls, just like the night stalker did, and the bullets came from the same 25 caliber gun as the previous two attacks. Peter Pan ended up becoming the Night Stalker's last murder victim. Ramirez committed one attack after that, this time in Mission Viejo outside of LA County. On August the 24th, he shot 30-year-old Bill Carnes three times in the head before beating up and raping his fiancée, Inez Erickson. But Carnes pulled through and survived his injuries. These last two months had been a torrent of violence and death, but the tables would soon be turned on the Night Stalker as Ramirez would receive a lot more notoriety than he bargained for. Throughout his entire killing spree, the Night Stalker made little effort to conceal his tracks, leaving behind evidence and plenty of witnesses who could identify him. As it would be later revealed at his trial, he thought he was being protected by the devil, when in reality, it was the pure random nature and the large coverage area of his attacks which kept the police one step behind him. The one thing that the killer did take the time to do was not leave any fingerprints. The police have long considered that finding a print would be the key to identifying their man, and toward the end of August, they got their wish. It all started on August the 24th, the same night as the attack on Bill Carnes and Inez Erickson. The Night Stalker tried to assault another family in Mission Viejo, the Ramirez, but he was spotted and ran away. As he was leaving, 13-year-old James Romero saw the make, model, and part of the license plate of the stolen car that Moraes was driving, an orange Toyota station wagon, and he told the police. Working with this new lead, investigators found the stolen vehicle, and inside they found the big break in their case. A fingerprint. This was still the 1980s, so there was no automated database. Things went a little slower, but a week later, police finally had a name. Richard Ramirez. His prints were on a file from a car theft charge back in 1984, and by the end of the month, his face was plastered all over the city. Ramirez had actually been out of town for a few days, trying to visit his brother in Arizona. When he returned to Los Angeles on August the 31st, he had no idea that he was the most wanted man in the city. He first realized when he saw his face on the front page of a newspaper inside a liquor store and was recognized by some bystanders who began shouting for the police. He made a run for it, and he tried to carjack a woman named Angie Della Torre. She screamed for help, and soon enough the entire neighborhood descended upon Ramirez, hitting him with boots, fists, metal poles, barbecue tongs, and whatever else they could grab. They were not afraid of him anymore. In that moment, he wasn't a bogeyman who struck at you while you were most vulnerable. He was just another violent junkie. By the time the police arrived, they had to save the killer from his victims, not the other way around. So, who was the Night Stalker? He was born Ricardo Leva Munoz Ramirez on February 29, 1960, in El Paso, Texas, the youngest of five children of Julian and Mercedes Ramirez. His father smacked him around when he was a kid, but it was his older cousin who had the most influence on him growing up. To the outside world, Miguel Mike Ramirez was a Green Beret and respected Vietnam veteran. Richard, however, knew the true sadistic side of his cousin, who had told him stories of how he raped, tortured, and murdered Vietnamese women, and even showed him Polaroids of himself in action. Then, when he was 13 years old, Richard Ramirez witnessed his cousin murder his wife during an argument by shooting her in the face. After that event, his behavior and demeanor changed. He used a lot of drugs, started committing petty crimes, and also developed an interest in Satanism. All the building blocks for making the Night Stalker have been laid down. His trial as a media circus quickly turning into the most expensive trial in the history of Los Angeles County until the O.J. Simpson case a few years later. Ramirez was enjoying his newfound fame, oftentimes showing pentagrams to the camera or shouting Hail Satan during the hearings. His lawyers tried every trick in the book to get the proceedings delayed or moved, and although they managed to stretch the trial over multiple years, the result was still definitive. Richard Ramirez was found guilty of over 40 charges, including 13 counts of murder, and he was sentenced to death. He spent the next 24 years of his life on death row at San Quentin State Prison. He even got married in 1996 to one of his groupies who fell in love with him during the trial, who described Ramirez as being kind, funny, charming, and a really great person. She eventually divorced him in 2009 when the police linked him to the murder of eight-year-old Mei Lung, but he got engaged to another woman soon after. Ramirez died on June 7, 2013 due to complications from B-cell lymphoma, leaving behind a legacy of terror unlike any other in the history of Los Angeles. He never expressed any remorse for his actions, and when he received the death penalty, he simply said, big deal, death always comes with a territory. See you in Disneyland. So I'm not going to ask whether you enjoyed today's video, but I do hope you found it interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe, and thank you for watching.